about their impacts on public land, um, you know, what they can do for us, um, how we're using them, about the laws regulating um, their use, and what public land agencies can and can't do uh, to manage drones on public lands. Um, so uh, we're excited to be here today. We have some really great speakers. Uh, we don't have time to introduce everyone today, but if you could go ahead, and I know some of you have already started, put your name and organization in the chat. That would be really helpful. Um, I think as Laura has already said, we're staying as a full group today and we'll be doing um, questions and answers at the end of all of the presentations. Um, but if you have a question that can't wait, please go ahead and feel free to put it in the chat and we will try to respond to it. Um, so, uh, and we'll have about 20 minutes for q and I hope. So I hope that's um, plenty of time. Um, Alicia Sanchez, um, my um, co-conspirator um, for today, is going to go over the next, uh, going to speak next and go over some basic housekeeping. All right. So in case you just logged on, I just wanted to do a quick recap it, to avoid any background noise. If you could please put yourselves on mute, that would be greatly appreciated. We also wanted to flag that this presentation is being recorded and will be posted online and accessible after the fact, as well as the PowerPoint presentations here. Additionally, in the Q&A, if we do not have enough time to get to your question, we will be monitoring the chat, making sure we're tracking tracking all of that so that we can follow up with you via email after the fact. Thank you very much. And I think that we are poised for a great talk here. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I think, Laura, uh, we were going to do um, ask for some, uh, we have three polling questions that uh, we have that I think Laura is going to pull up for us. And um, there they are. So if you could go ahead um, and, and answer those, that would be great. Um, I think this will help the speakers also understand who's in the audience and um, just in general will be helpful. So thanks for doing that. So do you use drones in your regular conservation work? Looks like, um, looks like it's kind of split pretty evenly, maybe a little bit more. And yes, um, using drones as a personal um, hobby. So looks like the first question, yeah, it's uh, yeah, most of us use, well, yeah, still coming in, still looks like it's pretty split. The second um, question is how familiar are you with UAVs, drones, and the regulations on public lands? Um, looks like most of us are somewhat familiar um, and then familiar and then not familiar and then has your organization implemented drone use best practices or other protocols and looks like 44 hmm, percent yes 28 percent no somewhat so um and then um a few of us our organizations don't use drones at all Okay, so that I think is really interesting and helpful. Um, that's kind of, um, I'm kind of pleased to see like a split, you know, um, and that, it, that it's kind of not 90% this, 10% that. And it's kind of the purpose of these Chicago Wilderness Cafes um, is to create like a friendly, informal, casual forum where we can all get um, more educated um, and learn from others. And I think that's always been one of the strengths of Chicago Wilderness is we have access to these phenomenal experts. Um, so we don't each have to become experts on the topic matter, but we can lean on our, our partners and friends. So that's, um, that's really great to see. Um, okay, so thank you for that. I think um, I will now, um, we will launch right into the presentation and it's my pleasure to introduce two of my colleagues. Um, Anthony Tyndall, um, uh, he's with the Forest Preserves. He's uh, the Policy and Sustainability Manager of the Forest Preserves. And he, uh, he does a lot. He um, oversees the Policy, Sustainability and Climate Resilience Agenda and the activities that the Forest Preserve manages. He is also on the National Advisory Board for the Union of Concerned Scientists. 
and is vice chairman of the advisory board for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So he will go first, and then he will be joined by um, another one of our colleagues, Garrett Weiss, who is the Geo Information Systems Manager for the Forest Preserves. He manages all of um, all facets of data that relate to when you manage a huge public land agency uh, like the Forest Preserves. We have seventy thousand acres. So uh, Garrett and his colleagues um, oversee the data related to trails, uh, recreational amenities, buildings, facilities, and assists with um, planning, land acquisition, and the development of maps. So um, they are up next. So Anthony, can I turn it over to you? Great, thank you so much, Michelle, for the introduction and for CW for giving us this opportunity to dialogue with its members and guests about UAV drones in public natural areas. I'm really looking forward to hearing from the representatives from the National Park Service and the thoughts and ideas many of you have who are on this call today during the questions and answer period. Next slide. So in my role as policy and sustainability, sustainability manager for the Forest Preserves of Cook County, I've had the pleasure of working on a number of key projects as it relates to this topic area for the past seven years. I do want to help set the stage for us all about drones and how land management agencies are responding to this type of technology. Before I do, I just want to talk a little bit about the Forest Preserves of Cook County to help give some context about who we are and why we are having or wanting to have this conversation. So the Forest Preserves of Cook County is a 70,000 acre public land management agency representing over 11% of Cook County. Our mission is to acquire, restore, and manage lands for the purpose of protecting and preserving public open space with its natural wonders and all of its associated wildlife in a natural state for the education, pleasure, and recreation for the public now and in the future. Next slide. So for folks who may not know about UAV drones and their capabilities, I will briefly highlight what we are talking about. So unmanned aerial vehicles are comprised of unmanned aircraft and equipment. They're commonly known as drones. Next slide. So drones can be used for a number of different purposes. They can be used for recreational purposes, for all sorts of peoples wanting to just have fun. They can be used for commercial purposes, like when Amazon indicated that they will start using them for delivery purposes. They're also used for military to conduct warfare. Our law enforcement generally uses them for search and find rescues. And they're also used for research and planning purposes for both private and public sector agencies. So as a land manager, we are definitely interested in all sorts of technologies that can be used to help support our mission. We are also interested in how these same technologies are or can be used to hinder or threaten our core ecological and wildlife protection and preservation goals. So now I'm gonna talk briefly about the regulations of drones and the public position the forest preserves of Cook County has as it relates to drones. There are a number of entities that regulate in some form or fashion UAV drones. The federal government regulates the nation's airspace and that is administered by the FAA. The FAA has specific rules for drones that are being flown for recreational and non-recreational purposes. These rules have been recently updated and are reflected in this chart. Some of the new rules highlighted in red are of particular interest to us as they require drones that fly at night be equipped with functioning lighting. The new rules also allow routine drones to be flown over people. These two new rules give pause to us, which I will discuss why in some forthcoming slides. In addition to the FAA, some federal, state, and local governments have also imposed laws that regulate how, when, 
or where drones can and cannot be used. For example, many state and local governments prohibit drones from being anywhere near prisons. There are also bans at national, state, and local parks. In 2015, the city of Chicago passed a law that banned drones flying directly over a person or someone else's property or be flown within five miles from an airport or be flown anywhere near a church, school, hospital, or police station without consent. Next slide. So the Forest Preserves of Cook County does recognize that the FAA regulates the, na the nation's airspace. Our public position is that we regulate who and what goes on and off our property. As such, in 2016, we adopted our drone usage policy for the general public. This policy was drafted in consultation with the FAA. The policy was crafted with the goal of helping us protect nature and wildlife, to ensure public safety, and to have a great, and so that our visitors have a great experience, and to help promote appropriate usage of drones while in nature. One of the key highlights of the policy was the designation of 12 locations around Cook County where drones can take off from and or land on our property. Next slide. These 12 locations are in every region of the county. The locations are not in restricted airspace near airports, but they are well, they were selected in areas that pose fewer risks to people, wildlife, and our natural and cultural assets. One aspect of the Forest Preserve's mission is recreation for the public. Every year, we get over 60 million visits from people all over the world who use our 300 miles of trails, who visit our nature centers, who use our 300 picnic groves, our 40 lakes and rivers, or who visit our Brookfield Zoo and Chicago Botanical Gardens. We are interested in bringing people into natural areas so that they can eventually join us in our goal of valuing our region's natural assets. Next slide. So as a land manager of natural areas with rare ecosystems, we strive to balance the recreational part of our mission with our core mission of protecting and conserving our natural and wildlife habitats. So anything we do or allow has to work in concert with protecting nature and wildlife. In this vein, we are especially cognizant of endangered species and the movement to reduce light pollution and the protection of bird migration patterns. Next slide. Cook County Forest Preserves are home to more than 113 threatened and endangered species. Next slide. Such as the bald eagle, the Blanding's turtle, the black crowned night heron, and the red and the river otter. Today you can see species that were almost gone or had disappeared entirely from our region, living once again in the forest preserves. Next slide. Many of these species are federally listed um, in the Endangered Species Act, and there are penalties for those who kill, injure, or harass them. Next slide. So the forest preserves wants to protect these threatened endangered species and all types of wildlife that have habitat that live within our natural areas. To minimize negative impacts drones have on animals, studies have recommended some of the following codes of practices. Anyone using drones should exercise caution to minimize the disturbance of wildlife, particularly where endangered species or ecologically sensitive habitats are involved. Utilize drones with low noise produ production and size. Avoid moving directly to, toward the animal as it may mimic a predator's movements. Cease flying if animals become excessively disturbed. 
And when conducting studies around animals with drones, the exact flight practices such as altitude and dis distance from animals and their responses of the animals should be reported as part of the study to assist future research and regulations. There are a lot more tips and suggestions that we can talk a little about during questions and answers. Next slide. So by helping promote appropriate usage of drones, we can help reduce situations like this from happening in our natural areas. Next slide. One of the new rules put in place by the FAA was the requiring of drones that fly at night be lighted. Lights at night is of concern to many who are in Chicagoland, especially those of us who are land and wildlife managers. In 2019, Chicago was named the worst place in America for birds due to our light pollution and skyscrapers not having bird-friendly windows. Over a half a billion birds die annually because of light pollution. Next slide. In response to this, the Forest Preserves has actively worked to reduce lights at night throughout our preserves. And we have started making upgrades to our building windows so that they can become bird friendly. Next slide. Our efforts to reduce light pollution was recently recognized by the International Dark Sky Association. This association has designated our Palos Preserves the largest urban night sky place in the world. In the Palos Preserves, you can see four times more stars at night than in downtown Chicago. So the new FAA rules allowing lighted drones at night, especially over natural and wildlife habitats, seems to be in contradiction to what the scientific community is recommending and what our own preservation efforts are trying to implement. Next slide. So getting back to our drone usage policy, one of the goals of the policy was to ensure public safety and a great visitor experience. The forest preserves are visited over 60 million times annually. So safety is critically important as a land manager to encourage residents and visitors who want to come into natural areas. In addition, people who visit natural areas like a forest preserve often want to avoid the hustle and bustle of urban life with all its associated noise pollution and technologies that seem to dominate our daily lives. Next slide. Our policy was created to help reduce the likelihood of drones from hurting humans and our property. We are cognizant of situations like this example. So our 12 authorized locations were created to reduce the likelihood of situations like that, like this example from happening in the forest preserves. Next slide. We also want to reduce and prevent technologies being used inappropriately on our property so that we can help safeguard the millions of children and families who visit our, our nature centers, our campgrounds, our aquatic centers and other properties. Next slide. So that is why we created our drone usage policy and why we are trying to educate the public to use drones appropriately if they fly in or over natural areas. People who fly drones can help us protect our children, our families, our wildlife and ecological habitats by knowing where and when to fly, respecting and protecting wildlife, by fly flying safely, and by, by following FAA rules and other governmental entity guidelines. I'm now going to turn this presentation over to our Forest Preserves GIS manager, Garrett Ways, who will talk about the Forest Preserves use of drones as a land management agency. Garrett. Thank you, Anthony. Um, at a high level, I will go over some of the benefits that drones can provide to an agency or organization. 
some of the things that we will cover are restoration monitoring, prescribed burn training, construction updates, plant health, and elevation data. Next slide. The Forest Preserves of Cook County currently uses a DJI Matrix 100 drone with a Parrot Sequoia camera. Next slide. Flights for this specific mapping drone are done through an app interface on an iPad. The mapping aspect of this drone allows us to create higher accuracy ground imagery with its Nader camera, meaning pointed straight down, and three axis gimbal for stabilization. Through the app, you provide the details of your flight, some of which are area, the area which you'd like to capture your imagery, height, speed, image overlap, and takeoff and landing points. Once you have provided it, provided those details, it will create a flight path and time length uh, allowing you to make adjustments as necessary for the number of batteries you have or time you'd like to spend flying. The white flight path you see here is automatically generated and then sent to the drone so that it knows the parameters of the flight. I won't go over all the safety considerations you will take during a flight, but I would just like to add here that even though the drone is pre-programmed, you should always have the flight control in your hands in case of emergency and always know where the potentially dangerous areas are, such as power lines, gathering of people, or high traffic areas. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we use a Parrot Sequoia camera, and I'll go over some of the specs here. It's a four band multi-spectral camera with a full color lens and four uh, subsequent bands, green, red, red edge, and near infrared. The camera with light sensor provides real-time illumination correction and removes the need for reflectance measurements and radiometric calibration, reducing the complexity uh, for collecting multi-spectral multi uh, excuse me, data, meaning that it's much quicker and easier to get your drone up and flying and back to the office with imagery that you can use to perform analysis. Next slide. So the Forest Preserves uses the drones uh, in several ways. One of, one of the more straightforward uses for a drone is for visual analysis. Um, for inspecting an area, in this case, you can quantify and assess the, su the success of a restoration area. Next slide. Another visual and something I don't personally do, but the Forest Preserve does take uh, video footage of prescri prescribed burns for educational and training purposes. Next slide. Another visual application, here you can take uh, before, during, and after images of construction sites. This is especially convenient when there are areas of concerns or trees that you would like to avoid being damaged. Next slide. Here, the application of the multi-spectral camera, camera comes in handy. With this type of imagery, the use of vegetation indices can become useful to identify areas of plant stress or success. Next slide. Finally, with the current drone post-processing software, most are equipped with features that can infer elevation from the position and elevation of the drone relative to the ground and piece together imagery like a puzzle coming up with measurements that can be surprisingly accurate with the right conditions. This technology is called structure from, mo from motion and is not quite as accurate and does not see below the uh, tree canopy as LIDAR does, but can be a valuable derivative of the imagery and your elevation with your uh, elevation uh, data demands. Next slide. And that is a brief overview of drones uh, in the Forest Preserve, their regulation, education, and use within the Forest Preserve of Cook County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Anthony. That was really great. We appreciate your sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, next up, uh, we're really excited to have two speakers from the National Park Service. 
Um, we're thrilled to have John Bueller and Kristen Swoboda joining us. Uh, John Bueller is the NPS Aviation Branch Chief. Um, this aviation branch supports fixed wing, rotary, UAS, and safety at the national level. He served in this role for three years and previously served as a special agent for 15 years. He's also worked as an auditor for several uh, federal agencies, worked for General Electric after serving over five years in the U.S. Army. So we're excited to have John. Uh, his colleague, Kristen Svoboda, is the National Park Service Unmanned Aircraft Systems Program Manager. The UAS program is comprised of 65 pilots and 81 aircraft. Um, its missions include wildland fire, uh, support, including mapping, aerial ignition, et cetera, search and rescue, all hazard support, law enforcement, cultural and natural resource support, and training flights. Kristen has served in this role for three years and previously worked at the Bureau of Reclamation as a UAS and GIS specialist. She's also worked in a number of positions within the wildland fire community, serving on engines and as a member of a hotshot crew. So uh, welcome, John and Kristen, and thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, John and I are very happy to be here, talk about the National Park Service, our unmanned aircraft systems programs, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the science and natural resource management use cases that we've done, and then touch on policy and some planning, mission planning. So just a little bit of background, the National Park Service currently has 19 UAS programs. We have regional programs and we have park programs. So those regional programs might be a regional inventory and monitoring program or a regional fire program. And then at the local park level, we might have a more refined um, natural resource or cultural resource monitoring group that you know, is only going to be doing surveys in that local park. Um, we do have all of our pilots go through a, they must pass their FAA Part 107, and then we send them through a week-long DOI um, UAS course, really teaching them on emergency procedures, and then um, a local bureau policy as well, how you fly inside your local bureau. And then if they're going on to fire, they would have another week-long course on how to communicate within a fire, a traffic fire area, or um, if they are going into a mapping, we would send them through a week-long mapping course on how to do, how to mm -hmm. operate and capture imagery so they could do structure for motion and get some of the data derivatives out of that. Kristen, I just wanted to pause real fast, uh, make sure I'm still seeing on my end your title slide. If you have, I don't know if anyone else is still just seeing the title yeah, slide. You just, yeah, sure, full screen. Okay. Let me see here. Sorry about that. Totally fine. Or or uh, play slideshow. Okay, can you see this now? I'm still getting a smaller view of slide number three. It's not in the full screen view yet. I can easily there switch. We there, there we go. go. There we go. Yeah. So again, sorry about that. Again, our 19 UAS programs where we have our regional programs, inventory and monitoring or a fire program or that smaller localized park program that's focusing on natural or um, historic resource monitoring, cultural resource monitoring. Some of the DOI, just a little bit of history across the Department of Interior. So we have 11 Department of Interior bureaus. Seven of them are involved in using UAS. We started in the be very beginning, if you can see my mouse, um, with the Raven and the T-Hawk, these were excess military equipment, just getting them, you know, um, out of the out of the military and into our hands. We were able to start to work with those aircraft. We migrated into a Falcon Hover and Falcon Fixed Wing and a Pulse Vapor, and then into a Solo. And then as these ones started to phase out right here, migrating into that Solo, now we are into our current um, fleet inventory for Department of Interior to, to utilize. Some of the standard cameras and sensors that we use. Um, we use a, a yellow, stand, yellow scan LIDAR sensor, some Velodyne sensors as well. We use a five band and 10 band MicaSense multispectral sensors. We have a, a series of natural color cameras that we use as well. The FLIR Tau radiometric camera, which we get that radiometric information off of the image. And then also we have the dual um, FLIR and natural color sensors that we use for a lot of missions too. Kristen, so I'm going sorry. back, on, I, I, you may want to go into presenter view. Um, you're, you're still, your slides are start showing, but just still smaller. I am really sorry about that. 
problem. It says I'm in presenter mode on my end. I'm really sorry. Oh, it's the joys of Zoom. And Kristen, if you would like me to share, just please let me know. Is this working any better? No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, can you um, share your full screen and then restart sharing? You can stop sharing and then restart. Stop share. You want to. And play slides. Slideshow. It's not taking it, Kristen. I can easily just pull up your slides, Christian, if that's a bit more simple. How about now? Are we there? N not yet. No. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and play this for me. I'm sorry about that. Oh, totally fine. This is the lovely part of Zoom. All right, everyone. Next. I believe, Kristen, you were right. Let me know when. Um, next slide. All right, here we go. Going back one. Thank you. So here we have um, our vegetation resource surveys. We really started um, with the Department of Interior, our flights across the bureaus, partnering together and learning from each other. We started with a low hanging fruit of vegetation surveys. We still do a lot of these um, surveys. In the early days, we were using color infrared cameras and natural color cameras, and then mixing that with a multi-spectral camera, really working on pulling out that NDVI, those normalized different vegetation indexes. And this allowed us to see you know, types and species and composition of that vegetation or the coverage area. And then we also started working with feature extraction. If you can look over on the right side of the screen, there's an image there with some red dots on it. And we're basically doing this vegetation survey to pull out um, the little bush that you see in the middle, that's rush skeleton weed, which is an invasive species out in the West. And so we started to work with machine learning and artificial intelligence software. So as we say, hey, here's the characteristics you're looking for, put a red dot where that is. And then we would have um, human interaction going back and forth, making sure that we're training that software just to you know, pick out the right, um, the right characteristics and giving us a confidence level in our data products. Next slide, please. And then we have slope stability analysis work with rock falls in this particular photo. One back. Thank you. In this particular photo, you'll notice that there's people on ropes. And what usually happens in these situations is we send people to work across that rock face. And they're looking for rocks that need to either be pinned or blasted. Because yeah, as you can see, there is a road below, which is hazardous to the public if any of those boulders or rocks were, able, were falling on the road or falling on a car. So we want to protect the public. And so in this particular case, it's also hazardous to have people on ropes as they span out across that rock face. And it would take you know, probably a week's worth of time to get all the way across and looking at every nook and cranny that, you know, of areas that are unstable. And in this particular use case, when we send up a drone, we can come back and get that imagery within like three or four hours, process that data. You can see that point cloud below from our structure from motion software that we use. And then th at that point, we can pinpoint those areas that maybe they need a second look by a human, you know, stick someone up, up on a rope and they can just get to that pinpoint spot. They're only up there for a short amount of time, you know, um, trying to see whether that rock is uh, unstable, if it needs to be pinned or blasted, or if it's actually OK. So in that case, you know, we're trying to minimize um, risk to our folks up on those ropes as well. Next slide, please. And then in this case, you can see that highlighted area. Back one slide. You can see that highlighted rock face right there. We've built this um, structure from motion um, point cloud in the background. Go back a couple slides. <laughs> I apologize. I think I jumped ahead. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Whoops. One. There we go. So again, that rock face that's highlighted in yellow with that point cloud behind it. Next slide. 
And from here, again, we're working with that change detection, that erosion landslide analysis over time. We want to be able to monitor what's moving on that slope. Obviously, there's a hazard to infrastructure below or to the people who work at that um, particular area. So we're so one of the things about using a UAS is we can do this repeatedly over every you know two or three months and really pull out those slope profiles that you see over there on the side where we can really pinpoint if there is something moving and how we would take care of that. We just don't want it to be a hazard to those folks below. And if we were to use manned aircraft in this situation, we just wouldn't get that imagery back very quickly and it would be very costly to do. Next slide, please. And then here again with bird surveys, and this particular survey is very interesting because in the beginning we were trying to use fixed wing aircraft to do this survey with the sandhill cranes, but it was too noisy and it was disrupted for that wildlife, and so they would fly off and we couldn't, you know, get an estimate of of their um, of their nesting sites. So then when fixed wing UAS came in, we were able to fly over that using that thermal imagery sensor, again, doing that feature extraction where white is hot in that thermal imagery and be able to pull out, train that software to pull out those spots. And then we can start to get a, a, a species count of those nesting sites. And you can see where there's a, the corridor of that species coming down the center of the slide. And then over time, when we fly this repeatedly, we can start to see whether that population is increasing or decreasing. Next slide, please. And then this Pleistocene trackway mapping, very interesting study that was going on. This um, was actually a very extremely fragile fossilized soil. Well, the soil itself is extremely fragile. And then there was these footprints that they found from the late ice age. And so they were able to use a UAS. We flew that. You could uh, measure the distance across the length and the width of those footprints, as well as the stride that that mammoth was taking. And they could depict kind of the age of what that mammoth was. So, and on top of that, it's an extremely sensitive area, so we don't want a lot of people walking through there. We want to protect that area. And so, again, using drones, you know, is a great way to, you know, capture some of that data. And then we also have a new project coming up this spring where they found some more tracks in that, in that park as well. So looking for more interesting information to be forthcoming. Next slide, please. And then dam removal. So this was up on Olympic National Forest. There was a dam that was going to be removed. It had 100 years plus of silt sedimentation behind that dam. And the concern here became, what's going to happen when we breach that dam? What is it going to do to the downstream habitat? Is it going to you know, destroy the fisheries habitat? So this was a project that we flew a number of times over the course of uh, three or four years, every few months, just to see what was happening, if we were going to have that channelized stream with really fast water going down, or if it was going to start to build in its meanders and, you know, starting to um, create pools and riffles and things of that nature. So, and, and to hopefully not destroy the spawning areas. Next slide, please. Wildland fire is another big use that we use drones for. Um, not only do we use the low altitude drones, but we also contract out in the summers with call when needed um, UAS operators who operate from that medium altitude in the airspace, so 10,000 to 45,000. And what we do in combination with both those low altitude and medium altitude drones, we're able to provide situational awareness, um, mapping the fire perimeters as the fire is moving and we get that information back to an incident command center and incident management team. They're able to disseminate that information and move resources around on the fire. We do a lot of the hotspot detection where we can actually bring in a crew to work on those hotspots and hopefully, you know, kind of help um, remediate the head of the fire there or the sides of the fire from spreading out by working on those hotspots. We also do a lot with aerial ignition from a drone. And you can see here in the upper right, on the upper right side of the slide, there's a PSD machine under that DJI M600 that actually holds plastic sphere dispenser, holds ping pong sized balls with potassium permanganate inside. And then when we shoot it out the drone, it, it, it's injected with glycol on the way down. And that burns, um, when it hits the ground, it starts a low ground fire. So we're helping to try to steal the fuel away from the head of the fire and hopefully slow down that fire and help our resources to contain that fire. The, the great thing about using drones in this world right now is when we use helicopters to do these back burns, we're requiring that helicopter to fly really low and slow with folks on board operating not only the helicopter, but the but that um, plastic sphere dispenser technology. And so in manned air aviation, altitude is our friend if something happens with the aircraft, if an engine goes out. And so if an engine goes out when a helicopter is flying that low and slow, you're really not giving them any options to, to be able to land safely. So 
any time that we can mitigate risk from our folks on the ground or in the air, we would like to use drones to do that. Next slide, please. So post-fire data collection is also another thing that we are using UAS for. We can, after the fire comes through, we can see that survival or mortality of, of what's happening, you know, after the fire of those trees. Um, we can start to really dig into the fire characteristics, like the intensity, seeing how severe it burned in the soils, whether it's like a, a centimeter into the soil level or whether it burned six or seven, you know, inches down into that soil level. So that really starts to give us a, a picture of what's going on, you know, with the severity of the fire and how the fire moved. And then we can start building our fire behavior calculations, going back and building prediction module prediction mod models for future fires that might have similar, you know, tree species, uh, topography, weather characteristics. Uh, next slide. And then here again, you can see over in the left hand where there's a burn, no burn contact zone moving over to your burn severity, you know, built off of these. This was taken with 10 band multispectral where we can see that that red part is where it burned really hard versus the no contact zone, which is, which is cooler or shows green. And then same thing with fire line intensity where we have the bright orange and red being a very intense part of the fire versus the cooler parts where it didn't burn in blue. And then finally from that, we can build fuel models where we're looking at grass shrub or timber understory or timber litter. And you can kind of see how the fire was moving through that, through that area. Next slide. And then also we use a post-fire data collection with UAS for um, erosion and stabilization of the soil. So you can see here, we have folks who have going back in to try to put water bars in. As soon as there is a rain event, we don't, wash, we don't want that actual slope to wash away. We wanna be able to kind of stabilize that area and not have channelized um, water just running down, running off the hill. Next slide. And then um, archaeology and cultural resource inventories. This is becoming a bigger and bigger, um, bigger and bigger thing in the Park Service anyway. This particular one um, flight was done with a five band multispectral sensor. But the idea here is, you know, we're looking at different ways to detect, you know, where there might be a cultural resource the placement of that. Is it in a sensitive area? How do we classify that item? And I know right now that's, this is kind of like early years of what we would do. Currently, we have a lot of folks using LIDAR applications to see if there's any disturbance on the soil or ground penetrating radar to see if there might be any um, artifacts underneath the soil that they can detect with that ground penetrating radar. Next slide. And then floodplain mapping, you can see right there in the center picture um, with the elevation models there where you know, we've gone through, we've taken our imagery, we've stitched that together in our photogrammetric software. The middle picture, we start to digitize, digitize out that stream corridor. And then in the third, or the third part of that slide, you can see as the more water is moving through that channel, it's digitized out. And again, if we were to be at full flood, that would be digitized out onto those outer banks as well. And then uh, there's also the um, discharge and temperature. You can see on the right side where there's water coming, you know, from a system into another system. And how does that temperature gradient affect the, the habitat around it or the fisheries around it? And then finally, um, so our water turbidity, you can see in that center picture on the bottom where um, the right side, there's, there's turbidity in that water. And you can see it very clearly from a UAS. And then as the, the next little pool next to it, it's still turbid, but you can see that a lot of sediment has fallen out of that, that pool. Next slide. And this one is really, really kind of cool too with the reservoir operations, that center picture with the dam there, you can see how much water is behind that dam. You can monitor discharge rates. Then over on the left, there's a series of probably 300 pictures stitched together in our photogrammetric software. And then you can zoom into that data product and start to digitize out a, a high, high pool mark along that reservoir. You can build digital elevation models. You can go back in and digitize out low pool where that um, along the reservoir as well. And from here, you can start to dictate how much acre feet of water, what's the volume, the pool volume, whether it's at high pool or low, or low pool. And then over on the right, you can see the Hoover Dam right there with Lake Mead. And right now you can see that, that water line on the very top up there. there that's, that's the historic, high, that bright white is the historic water mark, the high water mark for Lake Mead. And right now we're under our drought conditions. We're monitoring a lot with both fixed wing and unmanned aircraft, as you can see in the, the lower right picture where the boat docks don't even reach the water right now. Next slide. 
And then dam inspections is another one right there in the center again is Hoover Dam. And typically we'd send people over on a ropes on ropes basically to do this. It's very hazardous. We uh, a lot of risk to our folks who are doing this and it would be probably a team of four and they would start at the top and work their way across and down, work their way across until they reach the bottom. And um, they're looking for that, you know, concrete deterioration or cracking, or maybe they're over on the left picture, you have, you know, an earthen dam where there might be an erosion or a landslide happening, or there might be some sort of leakage or seepage. So anything, we're looking for anything that would create that hydrologic failure in a dam. And so when we send people down on ropes, it's, it's, it's pretty hazardous and it's a time consuming process, where if you send out a drone, you can do, you can map the face of this dam in a couple hours, and then you get, you're getting millimeter level um, data. So now at this point, you're taking the risk away from our ropes team and you're, you're really plugging in and seeing where, you know, where is it that we can pinpoint where maintenance actually does need to happen. And then when you, maybe you send someone down on a rope to repair that, you know, they're spending minimal time, you know, having to do that process. So we're really trying to mitigate that risk from our employees. Next slide. And then again with river systems, um, you can see that the river corridor there on the right. You know you can get, uh, estimate your flow velocities over time as you start to you know map that that a floodplain mapping and you build your 1D and 2D models where you're starting to see underneath you know what the bottom of the river is doing as well. You can estimate your channel widths. Um, over on the left, you can see where you know, some um, we've been able to film reds locations using drones with that riffle there, and. Um, Another thing, just looking at that, is there enough, you know, large woody debris in, in that particular um, riverine system, you know, to create those pools and riffles and slow that water down and create in-stream habitat for the fisheries folks. Next slide. Flood stage monitoring. So this is also a really big one as well. You will go out and fly pre-flood, during the flood and post flood. And in this situation, when you have like high snowpack or, or um, rain, that's creating a lot of runoff into our reservoirs upstream. You know, again, these are 100 year old dams. We do not want them to be going to hydraulic failure. So the point of, you know, this is to release enough water that comes downstream to help you know, that dam from not going into hydraulic, hydrologic failure, but also not to flood out those folks you can see in some of those centers pictures where there's houses like right around along the river. You kind of want to make sure that that you're keeping the downstream um, people who live in that area safe, but also keeping the dam safe. So it's kind of that balance that we work with. Next slide. And then um, restoration projects. So we have a lot of this that goes uh, going along along river corridors where there might be a lot of human disturbance or maybe there's a lot of animal disturbance, say right there next to the river where you'd have cattle maybe in there and when they have those, you know, six feet or six feet, six inches of like a, you know, hoof prints in there. And then that area dries out and the water comes through and erodes it away pretty quickly. So by using UAS, we can go back in and start our restoration projects. Um, we can quickly over, you know, two or three months, keep going out there over the course of the next, you know, three or four years to see are, is our restoration projects, are they actually effective? Are they working? And if not, this gives us a quick picture of what we can do to change it to, to help restore those, those areas. Next slide. And then facilities inspections, that is also a big one. When I think of facilities in the National Park Service, we think, you know, bridges, roads, trails, wastewater, drinking water management, you know, systems. You know, we think um, uh, anything that would need a structural repair, essentially. So in this particular case, again, you can see the thermal image up on that left picture, the upper left picture. And um, a, we're trying to mitigate, you know, hazardous situations for our employees who would have to be up there walking around on a roof where and it would take them a day or so to go across that whole building whereas if we use UAS we can get that quick picture um, they can pinpoint right away where there might be a crack or some sort of ventilation loss again we don't want a lot of energy consumption going out from some of these older buildings if we can mitigate that and again pinpoint that exact area so now we have someone who goes up and makes repairs on those areas and they're not spending a lot of time up in the air up there and then also you know, we've used UAS for um, landslides and you can see the picture of Zion where there's a ro road closure because a landslide that occurred underneath the road. And then of course Denali, you know, we can take those repeated uh, images of the road closure there and what, how the land is moving. And, and that's actually a very active landslide. So we don't wanna have a lot of people up in that area. We just wanna be able to go back and repeatedly take pictures and, and see how that is progressing and moving. Next slide. 
And then underwater mapping with bath bathymetry. There's a lot of folks doing coastal mapping and marine research um, within DOI using this bathymetry system. And then of course you can do mapping of the bottoms of rivers and reservoirs, create your hydrography charts. You can see um, elevation profiles in that picture on the bottom right with the yellow profile going through the river. And then with the corresponding little graph there, that's the actual bottom of the river under that profile. So and this gives us a good picture of you know, maybe surface water velocity versus what's the velocity of water at depth? You know, is it scouring? Is it, you know, is there a bunch, is there sediment transport? Maybe there's vegetation in there. And so it just kind of gives you an idea of what's going on in that, in that system. Next slide. And then let's talk here a little bit about policy. Of course, um, the Park Service, we follow federal aviation, you know, policy. We need our Part 107 in place. We follow Department of Interior. Departmental Manuals 350 through 353. That's our aviation policy that all of DOI aviation must follow. We have a series of operational uh, procedure memorandum, especially OPM 11, which is the DOI UAS specific policy. We follow the presidential memorandum enacted by President Obama for uh, privacy information and data retention cycles. Um, if we're gonna fly on a fire, we follow the PMS 515. Currently we are under a secretarial order 3379. And in this case, many of those past use cases I was just currently talking about, we are not able to fly. We are only able to fly emergency situations at this time, which is unfortunate as we do have a lot of backed up projects that need to be flown with UAS. And then we are also under our current executive order 13981, which is doing, uh, which has to do with cybersecurity and not using Chinese drones. And then inside the park service, we have uh, lots of layers of policy as well. So we have our reference manual, uh, RM60 or it's for aviation management. We have regional park and unit aviation plans. We have policy memo 1405, which basically is a ban on the public flying in the National Park Service over our lands and waters, but also talks about ways in which internal flights can happen. And then we have aviation enhancements. The appendix five is if a park or region wants to start a UAS program, they fill out that appendix five. And then the appendix seven is getting that superintendent level approval at the park. We have a, a series of delegation of authority memos, and then we have an extensive compliance process, which I will talk about. Next slide. So look, talking a little bit more about that takeoff and landing approval from the superintendent, um, you can see here that it's outlines the four ways, the four existing ways pre-secretarial order in which you could fly within the National Park Service. So number one being um, the hobby craft, the model um, recreational use, where there are seven airstrips within the National Park Service that are just for hobby craft, and that is handled with a special use permit. We have administrative use, so that might be internal scientific studies, it might be search and rescue or fire ops, might be LE uh, law enforcement operations. And then number three, which was one of our biggest ones, was the scientific research and collecting permits. That might be um, with an outside researcher or a university. It might even be another a DOI Department of Interior Bureau like USGS who is coming in to periodically monitor one of their projects. The last um, way to fly would have been the commercial use authorization with a, handled also with a special use permit. And that would handle the big filming companies like Nat Geo and Discovery. And then if you'll notice the, the red marks in the circle right there, this Appendix 7 is also built off a best practices that we came up working uh, hand in hand with our Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division and, and, and in a way to avoid impacts to any of our natural, cultural, and historic resources. Next slide. So why is this in place? Well, because the Park Service, every single park or historic site has a mandate to protect whatever it, it is that, you know, we're, that area is protecting. So it might be a natural value like scenic or scientific quality. It might be a geologic history, or it might be um, some sort of rare habitat for wildlife or plant life, or it might be a marine protection area or, or something that we're protecting, you know, around the water source. Next slide. And then also it might be something of historic value. Uh, you know, it has a, a importance in history. It commemorates a person, a event or activity, or maybe it's a prehistoric Indian civil uh, civilization or site that relates back to the current lives of modern Americans like black history. Next slide. 
So with all of these things in mind, whatever each park is protecting, when you fill out that approval, asking the superintendent if you can do that UAS flight in your park, it, you might also have to file, uh, follow additional um, compliance, whether it uh, happens to be with endangered species, or maybe it's the Wilderness Act, or marine and mammal protection, you know, any of these things that might fall into place depending on what that park is protecting. Next slide. So these best practices that we develop with our Natural Skies and Night Sounds Division, um, we put them in place to assist personnel who are either approving or requesting a UAS flight. And again, it is very park specific concerns depending on what that park is actually protecting. And again, consistent with any of the upstream policy, you know, from the Federal uh, Aviation, and Aviation Administration, NTSB, you know, that presidential memoranda or Department of Interior require requirements or NPS aviation or compliance requirements. Next slide. So what is it that we are protecting? Wow, it could be anything. We could be just protecting that atmosphere of peace and tranquility. We could be protecting visual resources or natural resources, any sort of historic or commemorative locations within the park. And again, each of these parks have been instituted. They have a general management plan with founding documents of what they are protecting, and they might have natural resource condition assessments or any other planning documents there. So we need to really be aware of these things. Well, what is that park protecting? Next slide. So when we're having people come in and do missions, we really want them to be familiar with that mission area. Is it something, is it an area that has a noise sensitive species? Is there habitat there or nesting areas? So in that place, we would want them to employ some sort of quiet technology or maybe a different tactic that would reduce the sound of a drone that would be doing an overflight. And if it's a cultural area, like you can see in the lower left, if there's gonna be a lot of folks walking through that area on the lower left and the lower right, you don't wanna disturb their experience of that area. So we would think about timing of that flight. Maybe it needs to happen before the park opens or after the park closes. Next slide. Again, what, what, all the things that we could be protecting, the impacts of, of what UAS could do, we look at it from a, aspects of air all the way down to you know hydrologic, lightscape, soundscapes, view sheds. Again, that center photo, if you're out there looking at those majestic elf, you really don't wanna see a drone going through your area or hearing that zzz, zzz, zzz sound as it's, as it's you know doing the overflight. So we're really trying to protect those soundscapes and those view sheds from being interrupted by UAS. Next slide. So again, when we're trying to avoid those impacts, again, you might have to adjust your flight path. Maybe you need to fly at a higher altitude so it's not noisy, or maybe you, again, going back to timing, do, do you uh, do your flights before the park opens or after it closes? And then the frequency of flights. Can you do this flight once a year or does it have to be done once a month? Because what we're trying to do is, is even those cumulative effects that could happen from using a UAS, we wanna avoid any of those impacts to our resources. Next slide. And then going back to wilderness. So we have to complete our minimum requirements analysis, the MRA, and that is to assess any impact that could occur to the value and the character of that wilderness. So we would first start out with, is this flight necessary for the administration of this area? Will it cause significant impact to that, that character and value of that wilderness that we're trying to protect? Is it, the, is it a tool that will pro provide the least negative impact to that wilderness character and value? And in some cases, maybe you would, it's not the least negative impact. Maybe you need to send someone out on foot who, to do a survey. But if, I guess if you're protecting flora or fauna, you wouldn't want to send someone out on foot. You would probably rather use a UAS. Next slide. So when we're deciding whether um, UAS is the least impactful management tool or method to protect wilderness character and values, you know, in a, in a lot of our other worlds, we would say, oh, well, a UAS is more economic, you know, it's more convenient, we can fly it quite quickly over time. But when it comes to protecting wilderness, we do not even consider those factors. It's whether that is a that potential disruption is, is the least impactful to that actual character and value of that wilderness we're protecting. Next slide. 
So we want, we want our folks to consider what would happen in a lost link situation if you lose GPS or if you lose communication with your ground communication station, that GCS up to your drone. So what's that going to look like? How is it going to impact if it lands, if you have a downed aircraft or a flyaway? And we do, um, we do have GCS ground control system apps that track where the UAS is, where its last known point was, if that were to occur, so we can go ahead and retrieve that aircraft and hopefully um, have avoid any you know, uh, impacts to the resource, very minimal impact is what we're looking at. Next slide. So in this, in this, with respect to this, we ask people to use the quietest UAS they can, depending on, say, if there's that noise, noise sensitive species there, you know, or, you know, anything that, that could be disrupted by a UAS, we consider, please fly at a different altitude if that's more appropriate. You know, um, maybe it's more appropriate to use a fixed wing because they're typically quieter, quieter than a rotor wing aircraft. So there's um, anything that we're just trying to mitigate anything that would, you know, cause a reaction from wildlife or, or impact that resource. Next slide. Again, minimizing that audio and visual impact. Um, we also want to say, hey, let's 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 note anything that valuable that we could get from that flight. So if you have a mission out there where you might be filming um, a river corridor through a meadow, you might actually catch some wildlife in that, and maybe, or or you might identify the condition of that you know natural area, or you might identify something else in there. So we really want people to be able to share that data as appropriate. So one mission profile might end up benefiting like three or four different um, groups in the natural resource division. And then of course, if we see any sort of impact to, to wildlife and their changes of behavior, we wanna document that so it does not occur again. So we either do not do those flights or we mitigate it you know, another route. And then in the end, we want to implement safeguards that ensure that those locations of sensitive resource areas will not be made public in accordance to our existing policies and laws. Next slide. And then counter UAS system reporting. So we did send up, set up a counter UAS system down in the uh, Grand Canyon on the south rim. We placed it on top of a water tower. So that was able to capture flights up to 10 nautical miles away on the north rim. And you can see there where it captured their takeoff and landing points, their flight pattern, all of that was captured along with aircraft registration. If it was registered, it tells you what type of drone it is. And so that gave us some very valuable insight onto all the legal drone flights that were happening in the Grand Canyon. Um, it was affected by terrain. So the flights that did occur on East Rim, we weren't able to see very many of those. Next slide. And in this case, we can send that information back to our law enforcement. You know, if they are close and in the area, they can make that contact with that person if, it, if they need to be cited or educated, depending on what's going on. And then we do have um, law, law, law enforcement who may actually witness uh, a UAS taking off and they can go um, connect with those people and either educate them or cite them. We also have this investigative services hotline, and that is what a lot of the public contacts come through, where someone from the public actually witnessed an illegal drone flight, and, you know, they'll send us, they might send us pictures, or um, if they see it on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, which a lot of these videos get posted to, and of course, the, those people who post are using their, their handle, basically, their information, and so we can, we can submit that to our law enforcement, our investigative services group, and they can do as appropriate rather to contact those people and maybe they might be cited or maybe that's transferred to another law enforcement group depending on, on if it's on a boundary of a park with another um, federal entity. Next slide. All right, questions. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was really, really informative. John, is there anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, one of the major themes that we try to try to focus back on is education. Um, you know, we and communication with our visitors uh, through signage uh, to let people know you can't fly a drone here. Um, we can't even we can't even quantify how many flights out there that are taking place. It shouldn't be. Um, you know, we don't have drone detection systems at every park, but it really we want people to know it's it's impacting the visitor experience. And as I think Krista mentioned, you know, with that multiple times, it's we don't want to mess with the wildlife. We don't want to mess with the visitor. And then when we do fly, we ask our folks to make it clear that they're doing something official. Um, and, you know, we ask them to have a marked vehicle out there with a placard and that they're in uniform and that they take that opportunity. If any visitors are around to explain, like, it's not allowed, but we can do it. And here's why we're doing it and put some rationale behind it versus 
hey, we saw them flying and it must be good for us. Um, you know, on the enforcement side, we do get a lot of complaints, but honestly, it's it's really time consuming. Um, you know, yes, we may know what their screen sign is and, and it's on one of the different social media platforms, but, you know, coming from the law enforcement side, you have to work with, you know, a prosecutor, you have to get a subpoena. Um, and it's a lot of work for something that, and I hate to say this, when you boil down to it, it doesn't it doesn't get up to the top of the list of importance because, you know, is anyone getting hurt? And that's the big thing. And the answer is no. Um, so it, it's hard to get any traction with that. So that's why I roll back to the education and just let people know. Um, and I, I wish we could do more on the enforcement side, but uh, I think it's, it's going to get worse um, as we're seeing a lot more you know, the average citizen can go buy a drone really, really easily. It's much harder for us because we treat it like an aircraft. So our procurement standards um, have to use that. And the other big thing, Kristen showed wildland fire there. I mean, there's a lot of different applications and drones are great, but they drive us absolutely crazy during the fire season because the citizens come out, they want some, what they think is cool footage of a wildland fire. And we have a lot of metal flying around up there. There's a lot of movements going on with large air tankers, uh, helicopters, lead planes, our own UAS, and we have to shut everything down when there's an incursion. So, you know, we'll launch a DC-10 with 11,000 gallons of mud in it to help the ground folks, and they'll have to abort and turn around. Um, and then not to mention the dangers of those those individuals flying out there. If, if, if one of these is, you know, goes in the intake of one of those engines, I mean, you have a DC-10 with 11,000 gallons and they're flying about 400 feet really slow and that will be catastrophic. So that's what we're working on. Um, we have within the UAS community, we do a lot of natural resource cultural stuff, but the Wildland Fire Group also has our own committees to work on, on things with Wildland Fire because of, as Kristen mentioned, when we're doing aerial ignition with a helicopter, we've had two fatalities over the last four years. Um, and do we want to crash a drone? Absolutely not. I mean, it's about $45,000 for one of those drones and all the components. Um, and, but how do you can't equate that to someone losing their life? I mean, we will crash those all day long if it saves lives. Um, it, you know, a helicopter is going to be $3 million. Um, but it's really the risk aspect of it and keeping people alive. It's just not worth it. So that's what we're really trying to push. Um, and, and just to mention too, Kristen is not only our, our UAS program manager for the National Park Service, she's also our fixed wing manager. So in Kristen's portfolio, she has another 22 fixed wing aircraft as well. So um, we have realized that she is, it's too much for one person. We are going to hire a UAS coordinator as well uh, to help Kristen. So, but, uh, but yeah, I appreciate the opportunity here and get to talk to you all. I mean, like I said, it's kind of the outreach and education. Um, and just communication between groups so you can hear what we're doing, hopefully learn something from us, and then we can get some takeaways from you so we can all be better. But thank you. Appreciate everybody's time. Uh, John, can I just do a quick follow-up question? Then I know I'm seeing some questions in the chat that we want to get to. Um, but when you're talking about the dangers, uh, you know, people wanting, being attracted to the, the fires and wanting to get, you know, cool footage and all that, do you find that the education that you're doing I mean, I'm assuming people just don't know what kind of danger they're actually posing, right? Um, do you find that the education that you're doing is uh, working? I would say it's helping. Um, I wouldn't say it's working, uh, but it's helping. I think our, our number of uh, where we have to shut, I mean, we put a, a, a temporary flight restriction over the fires and we have a fire traffic area that Kristen mentioned, um, but we control all aircraft going in and out, anything under 17,500 feet. Um, but we've seen it's been pretty constant over the last couple of years um, when I I personally would have expected to see more incursions. So I think it's working. It's helping uh, again, really not working. But we uh, how do you catch someone? We, we do try to catch those people as quickly as we can. On our large fires, we do have a fair number of law enforcement officers there for security. Um, so if we have an idea where they are, uh, we can go out. One of the things with that drone detection system we're looking at um, if we have cell coverage and we have power, so that can be a generator too, we could put one of these systems up on a hilltop and, and help the entire fire, at least the line of sight portion and try to catch that because it, it, it really is truly of all things we do with UAS when we have an incursion, it, it, it literally costs when we do that several hundred thousand dollars every time we have to turn everything around and go back. As we all know, aircraft's really expensive. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, 
I think it's helping. Yeah. Um, yes, I will. Thank you for that. That's, um, it's good to know that it is helping. Um, a question I'm, that I'm seeing in the chat is, um, and maybe, uh, I, Anthony, maybe you, I think you've already tried to answer this, is do you know if any state parks have the same ability to ban private drone use? And John and Kristen, when you're talking about not allowing, um, people can't take off or land their drones in the National Park Service, but they could take off or land across the street, right? Yes, in theory they could because we do not own the airspace, but we really try to get us get across to people that we don't want you to take off land or operate over our parks because of the resources that we are trying to protect. And I think, again, that just goes back to the outreach and education piece of why we are putting these protections in place. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to. So it's it, you cannot ban it, but you can you are discouraging it. We discourage it just because it. it I'll use the term selfish, you know, it's if, if someone wants to really what they think, you know, I'm sure there's some great footage there, but they're, they're affecting a whole lot more people than just them. Than, is their footage worth everybody else's experience at the park? And I could say 99.9% .9 of people do not go to a, a state or a national park to hear drones buzzing around. So. Um, yeah, great. Another question um, from Mark Johnston. Is there a portal where UAS imagery and products are shared with the public? So um, a lot of our data is already um, supposed to be shareable with the public. At this point in time, I would say the USGS, the their NUPO, their National UAS Program Office, probably has the most shareable data posted. Thank you. I have a quick question. So I work on the policy and advocacy side of conservation and two years into a pandemic, there's still some restrictions on in-person meetings. So for example, we haven't been able to bring out elected officials to our preserves in the way that we normally would and give a tour to showcase our conservation work. So we've had to get creative in terms of other materials and mediums we can use to show the great work that we're doing. Um, so drones have come up quite a bit, the amazing footage that they can capture. Um, do you anticipate that even if we, when we do go back to more of that regular in-person, the quote unquote return to normal, that drones will still be in high demand? Because I really feel like the pandemic has changed how a lot of that advocacy work is done. Well, from our perspective in the Park Service, hand in hand with the pandemic, we had that Secretary Order 3379 that came down and the intent of that order was cybersecurity, no data collection with the UAS over any of the department's lands or waters. And so that right there, unless it's for an emergency purpose like saving human life or public safety or wildland fire, you know, those type of operations. So that has really shut down everything for us over the last two years, basically about the same time the pandemic you know, came about as well. So we're really hoping that in the near future, as we work through the secretary order and the executive order that came out about cybersecurity on drones, that we will start to initiate those those 2.0 blue drones, which have gone through a cybersecurity process and authorization to operate. And then we'll get those back into the hands of our um, resource and cultural folks to start using again. And at that point, it will explode from outside entities as well, wanting to fly in the park for research. It's really interesting. I didn't know about that order. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Um, oh, um, I see one more question um, from Rachel. Does the Forest Preserves or NPS have, um, do we have policies about capturing images of people with drones? So with the MPS, we do have to follow the presidential memorandum, which is the Privacy Information Act and um, Cybersecurity Act. And in this place, if you have collecting data where there's people in that picture, you're um, liable to either scrub out their faces and then um, we go through a data retention cycle. And then that data usually is in a chain of custody command. So it either has to be discarded in 180 days or it has to be in that chain of custody command that says it's authorized to be here in our data for over 180 days. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Eileen Siegel, you have your hand up. So I, 
for me, there's two issues here. And one is if we all feel it's inadequate for national parks, state parks, forest preserves to be unable to ban flights over protected lands. So just the fact of being able to regulate who lands or takes off, it feels very inadequate to me. So the first issue is, you know, is there a way collectively we can fight for that stronger ability? And then the second issue is, um, even if we are successful from the National Park Service, from what you said, John, we would still really need a public education campaign because even the things that you are able to regulate, people are still violating. So that's my second question, I guess, to the broader Chicago wilderness community is, is there a way collectively we can really promote that public education, whether or not we're ever successful regulating, you know, private use going over our land? Yeah, the, the, the over the land portion, it obviously really depends on the size of your park, you know, like size of some of our national parks compared to some of the, the smaller parks, they could take off on one side, fly over the top, fly around and come back. You know, it's, uh, you can't fly over the entire Grand Canyon, but collectively we have tried to talk to the FAA about it. Um, and right now there's, there's no, there's nothing that prohibits people from doing that. Uh, as long as they follow the general FAA flight rules, um, are they gonna change? Probably not. Um, and that, so it kind of ties our hands. Um, Again, it's that, you know, be a good neighbor um, kind of education. So I wish we could do more. I mean, there are a lot of different technologies out there. I mean, the Department of Defense does a lot of different things. Um, are we going to do that? No. I mean, are we going to grab control of drones and bring them back and park them at our feet? And then can we confiscate them? It's very different, you know, here in the U.S. versus if you obviously have the military doing something uh, overseas. But uh, so we're we're struggling with it. I think everybody is. Um, and I think just to get our, our leadership to understand what our problems are and so we can dedicate more resources and education in it. I mean, we do a lot of social media stuff. Our external affairs is constantly doing stuff. But, you know, can we get to everybody? And that's the hard part. Um, it's when people enter your park, do you give them a brochure to remind them of the, po the policy? And maybe that will help reduce some of the, the flights or at least explain what's going on. So... And, and Collectively, can we do something? I, I, I'd say right. we could try. I, I, I honestly, it would not be hopeful. I, I would not think we would change the FAA rule. Thanks. In past conversations with the FAA, they've also mentioned that if you start to post signs, no drone flights here, then that actually does give you a legal ground to stand on with local, state, and, and county sheriffs and folks of that nature. And then a lot of law enforcement you know, personnel, you know, what do you cite them for? You know what 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 will hold up um you know if it's a simple citation they can still fight that um and, and you know what regulation do you point to where there's you know a table of penalties basically say if you do this here's your here's the consequence and that's the hard part you know for us sometimes it's you we can we can cite people for harassing wildlife um so that's one uh, causing a nuisance but they're simple citations. And, and the bigger hammer is, you know, if we can get with the FAA to have their part 107 license revoked or suspended, but in all honesty, you know, I, it, it's, it's not like taking a fixed wing plane. Like you gotta, there's a lot more skill involved in that in a lot of ways and they can still fly without a part 107. I mean, I think we've all seen my here about four years ago, my oldest was 13. And he brought bought a drone and he was flying through our trees and our on our property within 20 minutes you know so it, pretty much anyone can grab them and learn it pretty quick so we're, that's why we're anticipating more of these are out there the more problems we're going to have so we need to up the ante on our end and, and try to get that education out there and get people on board and, you know to buy into the, the park experience thank Thanks. you for that um Thanks for that good question, Eileen. Um, uh, looks like we have a few more minutes. So Kathy Garrity, you had your hand up. Yes. Um, one, I, I think it's a great idea to um, do a public ag uh, agency campaign or um, public campaign around wildlife. And I was thinking um, recently people got together and did uh, a little campaign about owls because uh, 
Owls are now very popular in Chicago wilderness and people were uh, getting a little too close and harassing them a little too much. And I think Chicago wilderness can easily put together some sort of wildlife bill of rights or something that, that would be a public campaign. And then secondly, uh, just for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm with the Forest Preserves of Cook County and we are collecting uh, information and I put it in the chat, we, we're collecting information on negative encounters with drones. So if you have been walking and been buzzed by a drone or you're, um, you found damaged drones on your property or they ran into your vehicles, which we have a, a story on that, um, please uh, send them our way. We're, we're collecting them for the Illinois Association of Park Districts, who is uh, going to be presenting them to IDOT. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Great presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I think we have time for one more question and Jeffrey Jacobson. So thanks. So I'm a general counsel for the DuPage Forest Preserve and we're dealing with drones. Um, it's my opinion, it's going to be a lot harder because companies like Amazon are lobbying to make sure drones can fly all over America. In Illinois, we have a state statute that says no government agency can regulate drones. We have an ordinance, we have a permit fee. Um, I've heard arguments from the uh, National Drone Association that um, the Forest Preserve uses lawnmowers, that there's planes that can fly at a low level over forest preserves, and that the drones don't do anything different. And I think it's an uphill battle to stop drones. I think it's the same battle like stopping skateboards and parks. Um, they're now um, there. So while we have an ordinance and we refuse to get rid of it, I know Buffalo Grove has... Uh, eliminated their drone ordinance. And unless we can get government to uh, deal with this issue, I don't know what we're gonna do. Yeah, and, and so Krista and I, we can't lobby people. You know, we, we, we can't talk to members of Congress and, and try to do anything in our official capacity or even unofficial is too dangerous for us. But uh, um, we do have a congressional affairs unit here that is the point of contact. And we've been, you know, trying to push this forward. I mean. Of all people in the Department of Interior, Kristen's been the one that's been trying to push the drones more than anybody. Um, but it is an uphill battle. And it's, you know, right now, I just, it's just back to changing behavior of our visitors. Um, you know, I think the advantage you all have there in Chicago, you know, a lot of visitors in a smaller area, right? So your outreach can probably, you know, in person can be done a lot easier than, you know, someone that is, you know, in the Great Smoky Mountains out on a trail. I mean, we just don't have the staff to go everywhere, but I would, you know, I personally think you have some opportunities there where you could really do a campaign and help your, your state parks there in the Chicago parks in the wilderness. Um, There's an organization out of Michigan. They're actually putting people in the um, county forest preserves to try to get citations to bring this up to the appellate court or the Supreme Court um, to win cases. So they're actively challenging us. We haven't violated anyone in DuPage because they pretty much, I think they're avoiding us, fortunately, but they're out there and I'm sure the forest preserves, uh, the national parks are getting them too. Yeah. Well, there's privacy concerns that, you know, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name that lady that said that, but you know, what do you do when you have not so good person flying drones and zooming in on people, kids. I mean, what, what that's then, then you probably have some different statutes you could roll back to um, on that side, but you're giving them the vehicle to do it <laughs> and make it easier for them in a lot of ways. Um, so it's a, it's a problem. I mean, they're great. They're, they have so many positive applications. Um, and I think all the government agencies use them in that, that fashion, but it's the, the small minority of folks out there. I mean, I'd imagine Chicago Wilderness, you probably had record numbers of visitors the last couple of years. I mean, the park service, it was amazing. I mean, some of our parks blew through attendance records. And so it's, you know, simple math, you know, if 1% of the visitors are bad, you're going to have more visitors, more people. So more, more bad actors, but... We're just staying on top of it, trying to get out. 
Yeah, well, that's I, what we're trying to do here in Cook County too. So yeah. we're, we're we're trying to have a voice in, in terms of our public um, officials. You know, we're trying to educate our our elected officials about these issues and how drones are impacting our natural holdings and our land management practices. We're also trying to work through the regulatory process because the state has authorized the Illinois Department of Transportation to set up rules. So we are trying to work through the, the, that process as well. And then we're also trying to you know, expand our educational campaign. So both promoting why we're trying to reduce the likelihood of drones impacting or flying over our, 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 our natural areas. But then also, you know, we are also trying to document all of the things that we're seeing happen that you know go against our mission. So that way we can give that information back to the regulators so that they know that we are that we're seeing things. It's not just some ephemeral concern that we have, but we're actually seeing damages happen on the ground. So I think we have to, Chicago Wilderness have to fight all these type of battles because <laughs> it's only going to be a growing industry. So, you know, it's step by step, I think that's how we're approaching it. And it's just to try to anticipate what the impacts will be in five years with the, the, with the growth, right? I mean, you make a policy for today, but what's it going to be in five years? I mean, what happens when, you know, the individuals out there can fly a swarm of drones, um, you know, and they can control, you know, a dozen drones and they're flying in formation around your, your wilderness. I mean, is that, are they going to, are they okay with that? You know, I mean, it's a slippery slope. So we're just no drones. I mean, I think that's where the line in the sand has to be drawn. Well, I think you are all, um, this has been such a good conversation and I think we are going to end, we're going to try to end on a note of hanging on to how important education and outreach are um, because we, as we've seen over the last couple of years, people really do care about nature. They want to be out in it. And um, the more they know what they can do to protect the experience and the nature, I think we can grow our choir of advocates um, for responsible um, interactions. Um, so I want to, I think I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're down to a minute. This has been recorded. Any questions or, or um, please don't hesitate to follow up with us. Um, any questions that we didn't get to, we will be sure to follow up with you. And again, I want to give um, a really big thanks to John and Kristen, Garrett and Anthony um, for your participation today and for sharing your incredible knowledge with us today. I think it's been really, really helpful. Thank you. You're Thank everyone. You Have a good day. Everyone. Thanks, thanks everybody. It's great.